Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives. I was hipped to Matt's work by a good friend of mine, Drew Swift, who stumbled upon Hogtooth Knives on Instagram. Now, Drew was a Marine Scout sniper and was drawn to the Hogtooth name, but only recently realized he served with Matt back in the day. So uh, Matt forges a range of beautiful and menacing bowies, combat knives, kitchen knives, tomahawks, and other handmade implements. And Drew and I are now in a competition to see who's the first person to own a hogtooth knife. And uh, I guarantee it will be me and it will be a bowie. But first, are you crazy about knives? Do you like the show? Well, then check us out on Patreon. There are three levels of support. And for your patronage, you get Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the podcast, early access to the Sunday interview and midweek supplemental podcast with no ads during the show. And at the top tier of support, you're automatically entered into a monthly knife giveaway. Your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show, hosting, servers, apps, and equipment. And eventually, it will help fund the purchase of knives for review, donation, and giveaways. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us gets you. The quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. It was a journey getting here, sir. Yeah, one technical problem after another, huh? But here we are, and everything looks fine. And and there you are sitting in your log cabin. We were just talking about how uh, how you live in a log cabin, and that's amazing to me. Did you build that thing yourself? No, no, we bought it um, uh, I don't know, almost ten years ago, nine years ago now, I guess. Um, it was made uh, one previous owner, but yeah, uh, it's it's beautiful, and it's a piece of Americana, kind of kind of like your knives. Uh, <laughs> Not to get corny, but uh, so anyway, as I mentioned before, you know, Drew Swift. Drew was a, a guest, an early guest on this show. And uh, so you were a Marine Scout sniper. Uh, and, and that's how I got to know you. Tell, tell me what that's like. Um, well, I didn't. I was uh, when I was first on active duty, I wasn't a sniper, but I uh, that's how I knew Drew was. I was with a uh, with weapons company and he was with a sniper platoon. And uh, um. But then uh, eventually I ended up being able to go to uh, Sniper Platoon and uh, going to sniper school and stuff. So, um, yeah, it was good times. <laughs> well, what's uh, what's the what's it like? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it seems like there might be a whole lot of uh, hanging out and uh, doing nothing and then a whole lot of high activity. That's that's kind of how it seems from the movies. But. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, the wor working up to getting to school is definitely a lot of a lot of training, uh, and then school is really tough. Um, but then um, I don't know. It's um, it's not all all the movies put it out to be. It's all uh, um, it's it's not all the cool stuff. It's a lot of uh, a lot of humping with uh, heavy rocks and uh, long uh, hours sitting and waiting or uh, stalking and. Um, you don't you don't see the uh, you see all the cool stuff in the movies. You don't see the tough stuff. <laughs> all right. So um, knives. What what kind of role do they play when you're out scouting and you're stalking and you're out in the field and in a forward position like that? Um, you know, they an all around tool. You can use it for any one of numerous things. I I know um, one knife I have here, but I'll show you after. But uh, you know, use them for chipping loopholes through, you know, through building, you know, uh, concrete, brick, tile, um, digging holes, cutting roots, you know, everything, cutting MREs, you name it. Um, it's an all around tool. That it, it seems like in the field, a knife, I mean, obviously besides your rifle, the knife would be the most uh, invaluable tool out there 
for doing, like you said, everything, building shelters or, I mean, I don't, I, obviously I don't even know what, what uh, are, are the things you would actually use them for out there, but it seems like the knife could be the most universal of, of all the tools out there. That and a Leatherman. I, I bet, I bet guys yeah. carry Leatherman out there too. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, d definitely. Um, and the knife and a Leatherman I use, I mean, I probably carry more knives than most people, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I use use it for any number of things, you know, prying stuff open, prying ammo crates, prying doors open, you name it. Um, All right. So obviously you're a knife guy because you you forge knives for a living. But when did all of this start? Did this all start in the Marine Corps for you or have you always loved them? Oh, I've always, always loved them. Uh, I was real lucky as a kid. Um, my dad's one of my dad's good friends was Jimmy Fikes and, um, and Don Fogg. And um, my dad helped Jimmy make, uh, he was building a new shop. So my dad was helping him do the carpentry and stuff. And uh, as payment to my dad for his help, Jimmy made my brother and I each a knife. And actually I have mine right here. Oh, let me see. Oh. I made a piece of camp knife. <clears throat> and you can see his, I don't know if you can see his engraving on it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And uh, these are, I think they were W2 the old w2 um he made myself this one this was he named he used to name all his knives this one's tree bane oh my, my brother's was uh sap drinker was, we were both uh both in the scouts i think i was probably it was 1986 i got this one so um you know we we beat the living daylights out of these things so can you hold that up again, please, before you move on with your story? I just want to. This looks to me like a um, uh, like a Hudson Bay style yeah, knife. Yeah, yeah. God, it's beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, he and you'd never know that a twelve you know twelve year old kid beat the living daylights out of this thing for years. Right. Uh, and it's got a Coca Cola handle. It's a pretty thick spine. Oh yeah. But uh, yeah. So. That got me hooked, and I had um, I'd found. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about that. The uh, I had the um, Popter Popter Mechanics, I think it was, um, encyclopedias, and they had um, one book that was all about you know, not the whole book, but part of it was about making knives and building a forge and stuff like that. So I built a forge, a coal forge, out of you know an old sink and vacuum cleaner and 55 gallon drum as a hood. And, and uh, I started forging knives and I'd bring them over to Jimmy's house and he'd tell me if they sucked or well, usually they suck. So he'd tell me they suck. And then uh, he'd tell me to go back and do it again. So I'd go back and do it again. And uh, so I, and I eventually started hanging out at his shop and uh, you know, I'd see him and Don Fogg and occasionally you know, other big name guys, you know, Jim Schmidt would be by occasionally, Bud Hubbard, stuff, all these famous guys that at the time I didn't think anything of it, but all these guys are now legends in the knife making world. And I was just a kid kicking around the shop, getting in the how, way probably. How, how old were you at this time? Uh, I would have been 12, 13, 13. Wow. I think 12 when I started, probably 13 once I started going over there. And, uh, do you have any of those old knives from when you were twelve or thirteen? I I think I do. I don't I don't have any right here handy, but uh, yeah, I, I can dig some up and show you a picture. They're terrible, absolutely terrible. So what were your what were your kind of design inspirations? Because at twelve and thirteen, for me, I was watching Commando. Oh, yeah. I was watching uh, you know uh, Predator and the Rambo movies. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, those in you know back in the eighties, the Ninja thing was huge. So oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, survival knives and you know um so yeah I, um i tried to uh tried to look at jimmy's stuff and he you know he was doing a lot of bowies and he called them mexican bowies it had a lot longer of a uh of a clip at the front and stuff and uh i liked that stuff and uh and uh the camp knives um pretty much pretty much anything i tried to make anything you know I, at the time, it was kind of however it however it turned out. It turned out, but as I got better, I could design. You know, my designing and forging got better and stuff. So, all right. 
So this this your first forge was made from a sink and a vacuum cleaner and such. Now yep. tell us tell us what you're doing now. I, I assume you've moved beyond that initial forge. Tell us what your shop is like and and uh, you know what your process is like. Yeah, I built uh, I built my shop about eight years ago. It's uh, 24 by 24. I should have made it twice the size, but uh, I thought that would be okay at the time. Uh, so it's basically the size of a two car garage with a full second uh, second floor on it. Um, I mostly run a uh, propane forge now. I do do coal occasionally when just to go back to the roots and uh, occasionally I'm demonstrating and stuff. I'll use a coal forge, but I uh, mostly use a propane forge. I've got a power hammer that my, my brother and I built. It was a, a Kenyan style air hammer. Uh, my brother helped me build it. Actually, he did most of it, but, uh, <laughs> uh so I use that for, uh, I've had that for at least 20 years. Um, and just recently I just got a coal, uh, coal ironworks, 25 ton press. So that's, oh, wow. that's screwing things up quite a bit. So, um, but I've got a pretty well, pretty well outfitted shop now. I've been collecting this stuff my whole life. So, so <clears throat> the difference between, and I'm going to tell you what I've gleaned from forged and fire and see if it's correct. But so a, uh, the power hammer is the, is the, is obviously that it's a big power hammer, but the, but the press is something that you use to compress something when you're making, um, when you're, when you're taking different pieces of metal and forging them together. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. It, um, it does, it, it works in a similar fashion as a power hammer. It presses the dies down. Um, but it's a lot stronger than my power hammer and, um, it's definitely, uh, definitely a different skill set. So it took me a little while to uh, get used to the press, but um, it's it's a 25 ton. So my power hammer is basically about 60 pound. So it's oh, it okay. holds a you know a lot more uh, it moves a lot more metal. So I can I can uh, forge weld a billet of Damascus, you know, a lot bigger billet of Damascus because the throw the the throw between the dies is a lot bigger than my power hammer, um, and I can do it a lot faster on the press too. So. So do you make all your own steel? Do you, uh, do you make a lot of Damascus and? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I don't, I don't make any, you know, I don't per se make the steel the way some, some guys are doing nowadays. Um, but I do, uh, you know, I get 15 and 20, 1095, uh, you know, W2. Those are my favorites for, uh, for the most part. And, uh, yeah, I make my own Damascus and or pattern welded steel depends who you talk to. But pattern yeah, welded steel. Okay. Yeah. yeah, some people get all buttered about if you call pattern welded steel Damascus, but uh, oh, oh, interesting. Okay, oh, okay. Cool. I don't even get people start. Yeah, all these uh, keyboard heroes get all bent out of shape about it. <laughs> all right, well, you're someone who's actually making knives. Let's let's take a look at something you've got in front of you. I want to see what are you making now. So uh, I know you for your Bowies and this beautiful kitchen knife you uh, knife you recently made. Yeah, I, yeah, I've been doing a lot more, um, you know, uh, chef's knives and stuff lately. Uh, I don't know if you, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, raindrop pattern. It's kind of hard to get. I don't know if you could see it any better than I can on my screen, but I can but, definitely see that pattern welded steel. Yeah. It looks like Damascus to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, that's um, that is stabilized maple burl on the handle. So. Um, so that's that one. And then, uh, here's a, here's a Bowie I worked on not, I don't mm. know, last year, I guess. So that oh, one's, God, that's beautiful. Thanks. So that's a nickel, silver guard and ferrule, uh, walnut handle. And that blade was 1084, I think. 1084. So hold it, hold the handle and, uh, uh, guard up close to the camera. Let's, let's see what that looks like. Wow. So how, how do you describe your work? What, what is, what is the universal kind of through line with all your work? As far as what I, uh, what just like, it? just like your style, the kind of, the kind of thing you're going for, uh, you know, you, you, you held up that beautiful kitchen knife. And to me, I still see a little bit of Bowie knife in there. I still see yeah. a little bit of combat in there. Yeah, that's uh that's definitely a, uh, that's uh, most of my stuff is all, you know, based around tactical knives and, you know, 
Bowies and stuff like that. So uh, I've most re you know just recently in the last year or so been delving into the uh, chef knife thing. So it's it's kind of uh, hard to get the uh, <laughs> the the tactical out of my kitchen knives, but you know we're getting there. So I, I would imagine the biggest challenge in going from a tactical, uh, an actual tactical knife to a kitchen knife, even if you're keeping a similar profile that has some of the same design cues, is that a, a kitchen knife has to be so much thinner and, and yeah. it's got to be very flexible too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's a thing. The first couple of chef knives I made, the guys were like, yeah, it's awesome, but uh, can you make it way thinner? Because it's... <laughs> Because I always just, you know, I always uh, like the thick blade, you know, and I, uh, you know, like this is one of, this is one I carried on deployments and uh, I don't know if you can see that, but. Oh, wow. Did you make that? Uh, yeah. So that's, that one is, that's 154 CM. So I didn't, that was not forged, but that's stainless. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, like uh, this one, I, you know, I use it to pry doors open, chip holes through walls, uh, you name it, you know, you stick in the wall, use it as a step, whatever. So, um, yeah, getting, uh, getting into making thinner knives. I have to, I have to be very conscious of that <laughs> thin them down for the chef knives. So do you, do you, does a lot of that happen on the grinder or does most of that happen in the forging process? Uh, most of it in the forging process. Um, I do like to, um, you know, Forge them just a little bit thicker than I would normally because when I heat treat, I don't like to deal, you know, obviously you're, you're still going to deal with warping and twisting and stuff like that. But I usually forge them a little thicker and then grind them a little thinner you know, from there. But um, so a little bit of both. Uh, if you grind, if, if you forge them too thin, sometimes you can you can get warps and stuff when you're heat treating. So um, just to avoid that, I usually will uh, forge them a little bit thicker and then heat treat and then grind. Well, okay. So I have, uh, I have no experience in forging myself, um, except for watching forged in fire. And I'm a, I'm a sucker for that show. I love it. <laughs> and it's taught me a lot, I think. And, um, one thing it has taught me is that I, I, I find it, uh, kind of goes against the whole purpose when people shape things with saws and grinders uh, after forging, uh, it, it seems like you should try and shape the whole thing with the hammer or the or the tools as a hot piece of metal when you're forging. Um, am I being a purist, or 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 do you do, do I, those of you who forge feel that way? No, I, I definitely try to forge as close to the shape as possible. Um, yeah, some people, say, you know, as long as you get to where you're looking to go in the end, it doesn't matter. But I, uh, I like to try to get everything forged as close to the shape as possible. And, um, that's the way I think it should be done. But, you know, we, you know, go ahead. Look like you were to say something. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, so when you're, when you're moving hot metal with a hammer on an anvil, um, or, or you're doing that whole, the whole forging process, you, you keep the lights down low, right? Like a lot of it is, is about feel and about, about, about how your eyes interpret color and. Yeah. Yeah. I like to, I like definitely like to forge, you know, like today I was forging with the doors open just cause it was hot in the shop. But, uh, um, I like to keep it, keep it darker, darker. So you can see the colors better. You judge by, uh, you know, judge your temperatures by your, uh, by the colors of the steel. And um, especially heat treating, uh, heat treat, when I'm doing heat treating, that's the lights are out, windows are closed. You know, I try to keep it as dark as possible. But um, I can, you know, I can forge out in the daylight if I have to, but, it, you know, I, just because I know about where my colors are and how the uh, steel's reacting when I hammer it. So when you set out to make a new knife, is there a, a design process um, that you go through the same each time or how do you approach the creation of a new knife? I'll usually just, um, I'll, I'll go by what the person's looking to get, you know, if they're looking for a Bowie, I'll, I'll do, sometimes I'll draw, you know, draw a sketch on paper, but, uh, a lot of times I'll just draw it on my whiteboard in the shop, get it, you know, get it close and then forge it close, you know, to that and kind of let it go as it, as it will, um, while I'm forging it, you know, 
And if I see something, you know, if it uh, starts to take a little uh, direction and I like it, I'll keep going with that. But um, I kind of, I kind of like to just forge and, um, you know, with a basic shape in mind, like a Bowie or, you know, whatever. And then, uh, and then uh, just go from there. But sometimes I'll do a sketch and do it just, you know, to the sketch, you know, geez, keep measurements on my anvil or one of the anvils and uh, judge it, you know, keep taking measurements and stuff. But I like to just forge it and go with it. Yeah. It sounds like a, like a, a, a flow oriented process, kind of like making a painting, you know, where you have an idea of what you're going to, what the end product is supposed to be, uh, but you're not exactly sure how you're going to get there and things present themselves along the way that maybe you weren't expecting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if I see a, a, you know, a sweep of a Bowie blade that, uh, and I'm like, Hey, that looks pretty cool. I'm going to go with that. I'll, I'll continue with that direction. So tell me a little bit more about your, your mentors when you were a young man. Okay. So you go, you visit, you visit these, uh, you know, the shops of, of gents that have been doing this way longer than you and they send you back, you know, go try this, go try that. What, what was the, uh, did, was there a point where you kind of thought that you had learned what you could from those guys and it was time to move on? Tell me about that, that sort of mentorship relationship. Well, yeah, no, still to this day, I'd, I'd love to pick their brains every day if I could. Um, I, uh, it, it turns out I, Jimmy ended up moving back to Alabama when I was probably 17, I think. Uh, and then I was going in the Marine Corps anyway. So we kind of, you know, he moved back to Alabama and uh, I just kept going with my knives up here. And uh, Don ended up moving to Alabama at, at one point too. So I kind of, you know, just was talking to them on the phone and stuff after that. But, um, and uh, so I just stood, uh, try to send him pictures of what I was doing and whatnot and, just keep going where I, uh, you know, trying to make better knives all the time. So um, I actually reconnected with Don a couple of years ago. I saw him up at the New England School of Metalwork. Uh, I was doing a class with Jim Kroll up there, the uh, intro to bladesmithing class. And uh, saw Don up there and he, uh, he actually asked me if I would uh, take care of his anvil for him. So I have his anvil out in the shop now. That's what I, my primary anvil now. So that was pretty cool. Nice. Ooh, <clears throat> that Bowie up there on the right. Love right. that. Thanks. So how do you like teaching? I mean, is this uh, is this a thing you want to help, uh, you know, kind of keep going through the next generations? Yeah, I would definitely like to uh, teach more, teach some classes, teach more classes. Uh, I've got a, uh, a friend of mine in the shop. Actually, he's out there right now while I'm in here doing this and uh, trying to uh, teach him what I can. And, uh, I definitely enjoy trying to pass on anything I know to help anybody out. I like it. When I was a kid, I was going to knife shows before I even had my driver's license. I'm going to knife shows. <laughs> I still to remember to the, you know, to this day who at the knife shows were, uh, you know, were big in helping, you know, this young kid, learn or or uh, on the other hand there was guys who were like get away from the kid i'm i'm working here uh you know guys like jd smith was awesome i would see him at knife shows oh, yeah. the northeast cutlery collectors association knife shows they used to have a couple uh, one every every couple of months um so jd was always great um wayne valachovic i don't know if he's re he's been retired for a while so he, he was another master smith he was great um so yeah, I, I'd like to turn around and encourage you, you know, somebody who's interested in it. So uh, Jim, can you bring back the page? Um, there are a bunch of tomahawks at the bottom and I got to talk about these. First of all, two, two, two different things. They look like two different um, ways of making them. The, the one on the up, the ones on the upper right, right now, the, the sort of a Norse looking right. tomahawks. Um, are those drop forged? Uh, and I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe I shouldn't ask like that, but yeah, well, a drop forge would be the, like the, the giant power hammers that they would pull the, the hammer up and then it would drop. 
you know, so they, they would usually have like a dye, like they still do it in industrial settings today, but um, no, those are, those are forged by hand with the, uh, with the power hammer, obviously. But I, uh, those, those ones in particular, I use really thick truck leaf springs mm. and uh, chiseled the hole in there for the eye and then drifted the eye out and then forged the blade to shape from that. Um, so it, it's mostly handwork. God, they they are beautiful. So what 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 sort of different challenges do the tomahawks present? You know, when you're forging them, they can be a real pain pain in the ass. The uh, getting the eye punched straight through, having you know having to go straight through and not you know the, your chisel or your punch not going kicking off to one side, getting everything uh, everything straight and lined up. And then, you know, there's multiple different directions. You've got, you know, your vertical. And then if you're looking at the side, having the head come out uh, perpendicular to the handle. So that could, that could be difficult. And uh, punching the hole the right size, you know, if you punch it too big for your handle drift, then you either got to make another hand, you know, make a bigger handle. Oh, yeah. You know, um, so, yeah, there's a lot of different challenges on them. Um, not, not splitting it if you, you know, if you cause a crack when you're, when you're punching your hole or uh, it also seems you have to be kind of brushed up in your woodwork too. You got to be able to. Yeah. Which isn't my strong suit, but yeah, definitely. You got, uh, definitely got to, it's, I have, uh, now I use a tomahawk drift um, and I get the handles, um, you know, pre-cut handles that are, uh, you know, sh teardrop shaped like a tomahawk handle for the, uh, for some of them, um, but sometimes I, I, I make them too out of ash or hickory, but um, depends on the, the application. So you have the other two there that were um, uh, cord wrapped and they look like, for lack of a better term, full tang tomahawks, these ones uh, down on the bottom with the, with the, uh, with the spikes and everything. So I look at that and I think, well, this, this gentleman was a sniper. This looks like something that could, maybe come in handy uh in in combat you know for opening oh, yeah. doors and stuff like that exactly. was this the was this the kind of thing you carried with you uh did you yeah, make so, these for yourself or yeah i carried one of those um i still have it i think i keep it in my truck but um yeah i used to carry that on like a drop like you know attachment that i, that I made and uh people used to be like what the hell are you what are you doing with that and, and then uh and then we'd go into a building and I'd pop the hasp off a door or something with it. And they're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. They, you, you, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, they, they, they all wanted the battle axe too. Yeah. And uh, more than anything, I used it, the, the spike on the back for, you know, but chipping holes through walls and uh, mm -hmm. popping locks off doors and prying doors open, stuff like that. Uh, but it was, it was super handy. Um, yeah, it looks incredibly useful. And uh, uh, when I got a I got a tomahawk here on a, on the Knife Junkie channel here a, a while back that uh, Alan Alushowitz designed, sort of a tactical <clears throat> tactical tomahawk kind yeah. of thing. I got a lot of comments from military people saying, "Man, that would have come in so handy." Yeah, uh, you know, if I had that, absolutely. I guess for opening doors and all, you know, yeah, crates and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, guys will bust your balls. They're like, you know, what are you gonna do with a freaking tomahawk? And until they see, like, oh, well, while you're trying to open that thing with your Leatherman, I'm gonna pop it right open with this tomahawk. Yeah. This is <laughs> awesome looking tomahawk. So, uh, so you make tomahawks and you make Bowies. Have you made a tomahawk Bowie set? Because I mean, they're a classic. Uh... Yeah, no, you know, I haven't, and I, I keep, I keep meaning to do that, and. Uh, it's just one of those things that goes to the side. But, uh, yeah, I've always wanted to do a nice traditional Bowie Tomahawk set. But that's on the list. Yeah, maybe it'll be on my list. Maybe if it's on both of our lists, yeah, it'll get made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, this is what I like to do. I, I like to make commitments on the air so I can't back out of them. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I mentioned Forged in Fire before. What What do you think of that show? Are, are, do you like it? Do you enjoy it? Is it? Yeah, I enjoy it. Um... It's uh, it's definitely one of those things where it's a lot of cringe moments. You're like, oh, don't put it in the water. Don't put it in the water. And Even my wife like, says that. She's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Haven't you ever watched this show? You don't put it in the water. Right. But uh, it's been good. It's uh, it's definitely good, been good for business. Um, 
and it does get a little annoying sometimes if I'm demonstrating and people, every other person is like, when are you going to go on Fortune Fire? <laughs> or have you been, I was actually working, uh, doing a demonstration with uh, a buddy of mine, John Caruso, who was on, he was on the show yeah. on Forge of Fire and, he, and everybody kept asking him if he's going to be on Forge of Fire. And he's like, yeah, I, I was, I already was. <laughs> Stop asking. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's been really good. Uh, good for the community too. There's been a ton of growth of, you know, a lot of more knife makers out there, a lot of, a lot more interest in, in it. Uh, I think due to that show. Um, so it's, it's good. Uh, it's fun to watch. Well, I'm not asking if you're going on, but when you watch it, are there things that you, uh, you know, uh, I, like, how do you think you would do like three hours to make a knife just seems like a very, especially with some of the challenges, you know, first, oh, yeah. first, first you have to disassemble this car and then, you know, make something out of it. Right. Uh, how do you, do, does it ever make you want I me? Mean, you've been doing this a long time, man. Does it ever, ever make you wonder, uh, how you would do? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, definitely. You know, um, there's, a uh, obviously there's, a uh, you know, there's been some great, you know, bladesmiths on there that haven't won, um, you know, and whether it's, you know, stuff happens on, you know, anything yeah. happens on the show, you could, um, but I'd like to think I would do well, but you know, who knows? You know, yeah. Yeah. You, you get one fly in the ointment and you're, you're out of there. Um, but I've done a lot of, a lot of different, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't have, you know, didn't have money to buy, you know, good steel and stuff. So I was using leaf springs or, you know, crane cable Damascus and stuff like that. So I definitely experienced a lot of the, you know, putting a bunch of crap together to make a knife. Out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, who's your customer who's buying these knives from you and and how are they getting used do you know about this do people report back to you i uh, yeah occasionally I, I, well yeah occasionally i hear back um still a lot of a lot of tactical stuff a lot of military guys um i've got a few chefs that are that are um that are interested in buying knives and stuff um yeah it's uh it kind of runs the gamut of this uh kind of all over the place, but definitely, uh, you know, it's nice to get hear back from people that the knife performed well. And, um, yeah, I kind of all over the place. There's not really one set, uh, group of people that are buying the knives. It's kind of all over. So, uh, as, so how does it work with models? Okay. So if you have, um, if you're forging your knives, but you also have models, it seems like the, uh, the forged knives are kind of like fingerprints, each unique. I mean, I know you can get them within a reasonable amount of, uh, of sameness, but if you have a product line that's like, uh, or, or I should say a, a model that you keep want to reproduce that people are, are coming for it, is, does the forging aspect present an, an issue or a problem? Um, it, it, it depends. Not um i've got a few models here that uh that i i do mostly out of stainless um and uh those you know some of those i'll do you know, i'll have water jet and then uh you know grind okay. them uh, okay. but you can you can reproduce you know especially uh once you've made a couple of them it's it's not too bad to reproduce a pattern while you're forging it you know mm -hmm. uh, but um yeah certain stuff like uh i don't this is a carbon fiber one, but it's not a, so I do, I do a lot of these neck knives. Oh, cool. But this one was a collaboration with uh, John Kabasik. I don't know if you were, so this side is D2 and this side is carbon fiber. Oh, wow. So it weighs, you know, next to nothing, but I do a lot of these out of 154 CM too. Um, and I don't do the carbon fiber ones anymore. So wait, let me see the sheath for that real quick. Uh, I love neck, uh, neck knives, so the sheath is always. Oh yeah, that looks. This good. is the first generation of sheath. The new sheath, the new ones are much better, but this one's old. I like the recurve tanto too. I'm a sucker for that. Well, <laughs> what other what other knives do you get water jetted out? What other ones do you kind of have on a more of a, um, you know? Uh, um. So those ones, and then uh, I, I 
I've been doing more of this one like like I carried on deployment. I've been doing those for uh, different sniper, sniper platoons and sniper school and stuff. So that one I'll have water jetted out. Um, and then there's your purists out there who say if you use a water jet, you're not a, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, it's, it's people will say if you use a CNC, you're not a knife maker. If I had a CNC, I would use it. But uh, yeah, 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 you know that that that's the argument I always bring up. It's like, well, if if uh, Rembrandt had a movie camera, he would have used yeah. it. You know, Absolutely. yeah, he, he wasn't trying to be a purist. He was just trying to be an artist. Just right. Like, yeah, guys with CNCs are just trying to make some knives. You know. Yeah, exactly. The guys say, you know, I do a lot of blacksmithing too, and people are like, well, why don't you, you know, can you forge weld that? And or a, a traditional blacksmith would have wouldn't have wouldn't have used a welder or he wouldn't have, you know, pulled himself with a welder. He's like, if he, if he'd had a welder, he'd use the damn thing for sure. But they didn't have it back then. You know? Yeah. And, and what other things do we compare to the, you know, to, 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 to the past, you know, it's like, we don't do that with medicine. We don't say, right. well, tr pure traditional doctors of the 1800s would have sawed that off. You know, like right. we, we don't do that. So why should we do that with, with knives? I, I think it's a, it's a, the, it's the key, like I said earlier, the keyboard heroes that have never lifted a hammer, or, you know, uh, made anything, but they uh, they know it all because they read it on the internet. Yeah, right. They have <laughs> they have very strong opinions about things. Oh yeah, so, yeah. You could go down a huge rabbit hole with people who say the you know water jet. I don't see what the difference. If I spend six hours cutting knives out on my bandsaw, or I have them cut out with a water jet, it doesn't. Yeah, I, I'm I'm betting it's going to cost a lot more if I buy a knife that's been, uh, you know, one of 20 cut out of a bandsaw over yeah. a period of however many days. Right. So the, the the knife that you were holding up, the Bowie you were holding up that you took on deployment, yeah. um, is 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 this a excuse me? Is this a model that you offer currently? Uh, I that one I has uh, it's been just to. Uh, sniper school graduates. Now. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So, oh, that's actually a really cool. Um, uh, that's a that that makes that knife, yeah, uh, a special thing, like the Yarborough knife or or some of the other knives that have been you know given at uh, special forces schools and stuff. Right, right, yeah. So I just kind of, um, I keep that just for them now. Um, but uh, I've got. I don't, I don't know if I have anything else water jetted right here, but I've been kind of backing away from it. I've been doing, you know, a lot more forging lately. So um, I, I was for a little while doing a lot of the, a lot of the military stuff and I was doing a lot of, you know, guys wanted stainless to the 154 CM. And mm. uh, so I was doing a lot of stock removal stuff, but I'm uh, I've always forged along the way too, but um, now I'm trying to do a much more forging in Damascus and, stuff so i've got uh, how long you've been full-time oh not very long a couple weeks right now so oh really congratulations <laughs> thanks wow yeah. that's that's oh well, so what are your impressions of the business of of knife making there's not enough hours in the day <sighs> um yeah it's it's still getting the feel for it um it's uh it's definitely proven to be uh difficult to make you know keep myself not so, not so much on task but uh I've, I've got so many things to work on it's trying to hard sometimes hard to nail down okay finish this one and then start the next one or you know forge these three out and then we'll, tomorrow we'll grind or you know so this is still so what i'm figuring out as far as uh my weekly schedule as far as what day you know if i do a forging day and then try to do you know grinding and cleanup day and handles and guards and stuff like that so Still ironing out the bugs with that. We'll see see how that uh, how that grows. So, if you were to take us through the creation of one of your knives, like you just kind of did, what is it like? A, say to get a from uh, several lumps of steel or several plates of steel into a finished Bowie knife. Uh, how quickly could you do that? Or, or, or I mean, I'm not saying in in a in a sense where you have a bunch of orders and stuff. I just mean in an abstract sense. How quickly can you make that happen? Uh, I it, it it depends. You know, if it depends. Uh, you know, if it's a, a crazy Damascus pattern or if it's uh, just a, a mono steel. Um, you know, doing the Damascus obviously takes more time. Um, but uh, and then you know, then you've got 
you know, normalizing time and heat treating times, you know, so that's, you know, a couple hours here and there, you know, two hours in the tempering, whether it depending on the steel, whether you temper it once or twice. Anyway, it's, um, you know, if I was to sit down and do one, I could, I could probably do, you know, a, a day, two days. If, you know, oh, what? It depends I mean, on, uh, if it's something, you know, like that, uh, that Bowie that in the top left corner there, you know, with the ferrule alone, you know, took a couple hours just filing the, the ferrule, you know, the grooves around the ferrule and stuff. So, um, it depends on, uh, on if it's something simple, definitely a day. You know, something more complex in you know, a couple of days. Man, I, I just look at these and to me, I, I can't imagine. They seem like works of of longer periods of time to me. And obviously, it, I, I've never done it myself. So it, it's all. But I look at that Bowie, say, right below your dog there. And yeah. uh, and to me, I can't believe you would. That could be made in just a couple of days. But yeah, but, but I don't. I don't mean to myth myth mythologize what you do, but still, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I would say a couple of days. It would. It depends. You know, obviously, if things go wrong, you you screw up a handguard, you screw up a ferrule or a handle. Like I had a, I had a handle piece of handle wood split on me the other day, and had to start over. So you know, so that stuff happens. Yeah. And, you know, and then you had a had a another few hours or day to your night you know, to that knife. But so do you ever test these knives? Uh, do you? Yeah. yeah. So what do you do? How do you, what do you run them through? Um, I like, I like chopping antlers, chopping two by fours. Antlers are great. You know, if, if, if you're, uh, if your edge can chop through, you know, a couple times through an antler, you're, you know, completely through an antler. It's pretty good, uh, pretty good edge holding and, so, so, uh, you know, cutting one inch manila rope, um, you know, basically ABS type testing stuff, chopping through two by fours. Uh, um, sometimes I'll just go out and hack trees down in the yard and chop into knots, especially chopping into knots on hardwood. Oh yeah. Knots are nasty and they can really mess up your edge. If you, if your heat treat's not right or your edge, you know, your edge geometry. So is it the sort of thing where if you uh, make a pattern welded steel and kind of use the same recipe over and over a few times in the same heat treat, then you don't have to test each one. It's just kind of assumed that it's going to perform the same way as all the others. Uh, I, I don't like to assume that because, you know, that's then you get a knife to a customer and, you know, they chip it, cutting a piece, you know, cutting a piece of toast or something. But uh, yeah, so I like to. Uh, every I've got a bunch of antlers in the shop. But every knife I'll definitely chop it. At least chop antlers. With. Oh wow! Okay, Make so sure. everything you send out, you do that. Yeah, I like. There's some sort of testing goes into everything. Because I don't like, you know, I don't like the feeling of sending a knife out and being like, ah, was it, was it good enough? I don't know. So I'd rather know, you know, that it's gonna hold an edge. It's gonna be tough. And um, yeah. I mean that's pretty amazing. I, I I don't imagine everyone does that, but uh, but for the purpose of these knives, especially if you're an outdoorsman, you're taking these things outside, you're you're right. camping and hunting with them. You right. know you don't you don't want to be making kindling and find out that your your knife can't handle it. Right. You don't want to end up with a two piece knife. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Wow. Two for the price of one. Yeah. Right. Or a real short knife. You know if you. This is his one actually. That's this is this is one uh, kind of modeled after a rifleman's knife. Ooh. But this is one I carry hunting, and then uh, this one's you know split deer carcass, you know, right up through the through the chest and everything. And um, so yeah, that's what I like to at least hold up that handle, please. Oh, I love that handle. <laughs> that that's the stag crown. Is that what that's called? Yeah, that's a uh, white tail. That's God, a crown. I love uh, Ever since um, Inglorious Bastards, I think uh, Brad oh, yeah. Pitt's Bowie had one of those, and I was just like, I gotta get a knife like that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Well, that's, so what makes that a rifleman's knife? Um, so when I was stationed down in North Carolina, I worked with a, I found uh, a knife maker local who um, who would let me work in his shop. And his name was Mickey Wise, and he did a lot of. Um, uh, rendezvous with the mountain men, uh, 
they kind of get around, get together and go camping basically. And, but they all do black powder stuff and they, they're all from like the, the mountain man, the trapping period of time. But it, this is what he called the rifleman's knife. So it's just a, you know, six inch long blade ish. Mm-hmm. Five or six long. And uh, just that, that profile, he called it a rifleman. So I don't know if that's really what it, what it was, but it's more like a fighter almost. But, uh, and that's a piece of wrought iron from a, uh, a wagon I found in the woods uh, behind my house. Wow. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. But so anyway. tell me about the, tell me about the, the little stepped, uh, stepped bit right at the, at the, the choil, the sharpening oh, yeah. choil. Yeah. I just, uh, that was kind of a trademark, uh, I don't know about a trademark, but Jimmy used to do stuff like that. little file work on that, in that area. How good you could see it. Yeah. I can see it pretty well. I, I don't know. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that was just, I thought it kind of looked, looked kind of cool. Yeah, that is a great, so that's your that's your hunting knife. So what do you do for sheaths now? How do you sheath uh, these things? It it depends on, the, like this one, it's got a, as you can see, it's pretty well beat up. Ooh, yeah. But um, that's a style I learned from, from Mickey Wise. It's a one piece, that loop, then a, then a, this piece here keeps it from it's laced up to, and this this part here where the hand guard or, you know the finger guard goes right. keeps the keeps the belt loop from sliding up so i do i do leather um kydex oh i got a little kydex one on my belt i like the horizontal kydex oh piece. yeah oh yeah that's nice so you do all your own oh look at that that looks like a roach belly to me that's sweet um so you do all your own leather yeah um it's not it's not my favorite thing to do but uh i i'm well not not that it's not my favorite thing to do i just um i'd like to be better at my leather work but um yeah i, I do my own leather work you know my own kydex and stuff um it's definitely something i've thought about with having somebody else make sheaths, but mm-hmm. uh, I haven't pursued that yet. So, cause it's not, that's not my passion, making sheaths. I, right. I want to make knives. Well, but, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, but I don't know. Some people think you're, you're uh, arrogant if you make a knife and don't send a sheath with it. So, you know, but, well, I don't some, know if it's an arrogance but, thing, but I know a lot of people probably don't know where to source a sheath and don't think sure. about it. And then it shows up without it. And they're like, Hey man, wait a second. Right. Yeah. So, so what about collaborating? Um, you, you, you would, you would collaborate with a sheath maker. What about collaborating with another knife maker? Is this something you're interested in doing or, or also, you know, collaborating with any sort of production companies or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, I would definitely do that. Um, the, uh, I actually have a have a blade in the shop that uh, Jim Kroll and I did together up at uh, the New England School of Metalwork. So one of these days I'll finish that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, and then they, there's the collaborations with uh, that carbon fiber one with John Kabasik. Right, right. Um, he does a lot of knives for uh, Kershaw. He designs knives for them. Um, I have talked to. Uh, a company before about the neck knives, the owner of the company really, I won't say their name, but, uh, cause I don't want to give them the satisfaction, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the owner of the company loved the neck knife that, that Rhino that's that, uh, recurve Tonto. Yeah. And, uh, then when it came time to go into production, the, the production manager didn't see it the same way, I guess. So it didn't uh, happen. Ah, I'm but, sorry to hear that. Yeah. Whatever. Things that, you know, Everything for a reason. Yeah, yeah, but I could be wearing one around my neck right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but in the future. So speaking of the future, where do you see hogtooth knives um, going in the future? How do you want to see that your company grow? Um, I, I definitely like to uh, keep doing the military stuff, uh, but I definitely also want to um, expand my uh, – my custom stuff. Uh, I'd eventually like to get to the point where I could just make whatever I want and people would buy it, mm-hmm. you know, rather than having to, having to take orders. Um, you know, just, I think taking orders kind of, not so much inhibits any creativity, but um, 
it's it's nice to you know to uh, try different techniques and do different stuff if and if you know um, if you're always filling orders you can't really take the time to you know to uh, expand in that direction and but uh, yeah I'd, I'd like to uh, get to a point where I can just make whatever whatever uh, floats my boat that day and uh, and then be able to sell it but you know we'll see see what happens. Well, so uh, you've been using Instagram, right? That's that's is that uh, how people should reach out to you? Is that how people should find you and put in orders and get in touch yeah, with you? That's the best way right now. Uh, my website sucks because I did it myself, and I'm not a computer guy. So you know, people comment, man, man, your website looks like a three year old made it. But uh, yeah, that for now, until I get my website straightened out, uh, Instagram's the best way. Uh, uh, you know, either it says right at the top to my email address or, uh, you know, or DM me through Instagram, but, um, that's Instagram has been a big help. So that's oh, man. Yeah. I always say like, uh, I feel like I've discovered so many knife makers through Instagram and, oh, yeah. and, and also knives that, that are in my collection now or on my list because of Instagram. It's like the perfect medium for, for knife makers, perfect social media for knife makers. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's so much easier than messing with my website. I can just take a picture, you know, still in the shop, go out, put it on a stump in front of the shop, take a picture and boom, yeah. it's, it's on there rather than trying to figure out now, how did I, how well, did it's, I and, and it's going to be seen by so many more eyes than your website, unless people right. are, are just consciously looking you up or, happen to happen upon you but yeah uh, yeah you can be a quick it can be a quick reaction that way check out what i'm making i'll take it <laughs> right yeah yeah for sure well matt i want to thank you for coming on the knife junkie podcast and telling us about your work and about your process i, I really really love your knives and uh i i don't own a hand forged knife and i think that's got to right. change yeah oh yeah we got to change that that's going to change post haste. And I don't have a hand forged Bowie and that, that would be my, that would be my right. brother. So at some point uh, we're going to be talking about that you that and me, good. and then there will be a video up there once I get it. All right. <laughs> Sounds great. All well, right. Matt. Oh, it's been a pleasure, man. Take care. Right. You too. Got a question or comment? Call the knife junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. It's not every day that we talk to a knife maker who is a uh, who who primarily forges, and uh, I think it's a I think it's a great business model because um, it's that hand forged uh, fingerprint nature of each knife that to me is most appealing. I mean, um, that's why I was asking him how quickly can you make these things, and uh, well, he's been doing it since he was twelve, so. The answer is right quick. I got to say that uh, knife he makes for the sniper schools are, uh, they look amazing. That looks like uh, a real slab of steel I'd love to have in my collection here. But it looks like I'm going to be getting something hand forged. And when I do, I will show it off to everyone proudly. And it will sit in, in the very small section of my collection of handmade knives. Uh, so for Jim working his magic behind the switcher and for Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives, I'm Bob DeMarco saying thanks again for showing up and uh, check us out next week for another great interview. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.